right. This is this is real. Well, uh, thanks for having me. This is uh, definitely a great opportunity. Something I never thought I would be doing, uh, but here I am. So we'll see how these things work. I've been doing Zoom meetings, which I might have 50 to 100 people in the Zoom meeting, but it doesn't look like this. Um, so just amazing to see all these men out here and um, when you guys all started talking like there's a lot of energy in here so um, that's that gets me fired up I know that so you guys might have seen um, this is my family uh, my wife Jennifer uh, I have two kids from my previous marriage uh, Braylon and Gabriella and then my wife has two from her previous marriage uh, Ethan and Jeremiah so my wife's favorite verse, which is uh, one of mine as well, uh, is Jeremiah 29:11, And I wanted to read that because I think it's an amazing verse. So, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So very, very true statement there. So I'm going to give you a little uh, bit of my life um, and the redemption story uh, that God has given me. Um, and I like these two pictures that I posted. Um, one, I look at that first picture as someone that's surrendering to God. And uh, that's definitely what I did. And then my wife... That's something that uh, definitely was part of my story. And uh, you can see the, the smiles on our faces. We're definitely very, very happy. And that's my favorite verse. Um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, uh, Philippians 4.13. So I even got it tattooed on me just so that I never forget it. Uh, it's a good talking point. So I have a clock with the time set at 4.13. So... I'm going to get into my story. I was trying to figure out which, which stories that I should tell and which stories not to tell because uh, I don't want to focus too much on the, the past because I don't want to live there. I'm, uh, I'm moving forward, but it is part of my story. So here it goes. So I was born uh, and raised in um, Southern California. I was born in uh, 1978. I uh, grew up there until I was uh, about 10 years old. I um, have one brother uh, who's six years older than me, and um, we grew up playing baseball uh, pretty much all year round, uh, riding skateboards, surfing. Uh, I grew up in Cerritos, Artesia, so um, in the 213 zip code down kind of by Long Beach area. So I used to go to Huntington Beach and Seal Beach and I uh, had my own custom-made surfboard that was 6-1 that one of the dads on one of my baseball teams, my dad had had him make me a surfboard uh, when I was, I think, eight years old. Uh, so I'd go surfing at the beaches with uh, my mom's box boys. She worked for Lucky's, if any of you are from California and know Lucky's. Um, she worked there for a lot of years. So um, a lot of the things that went on in, in our lives, like with my parents and stuff, I didn't learn until later on in life. And, you know, it kind of made a little bit more sense once I kind of learned uh, the, the whole story of uh, why we moved from California to, to Oregon. But um, when I was 10 years old, we took a trip to California, or to, excuse me, to Oregon uh, to visit my family uh, who lived in Medford, Oregon. And uh, my parents really liked it. It seemed pretty cool. I mean, it was very slow paced compared to California. Um, but my mom got offered a job at Albertsons. And uh, we came back from vacation and she said, we're, we're moving to Oregon. And uh, that was quite the culture shock uh, for me to go from riding surfboards, skateboards, playing baseball year round to I found myself when we moved to Oregon uh, growing my hair out. Um, I had a mullet, if you can imagine that, which they're actually coming back now. Um, I probably should have had a picture of that on the, on the board, but 
Um, I did rock the mullet. These were back in the Randy Johnson days, if you remember. So I was this kid from Southern California that was a pretty decent baseball player. Uh, so I thought, hey, I'm going to fit in. I'm going to grow my hair out just like everybody else. So um, I did that. I joined 4-H, uh, raised a pig, um, two pigs, and I wasn't doing it really to be in 4-H. I was doing it because I heard there was a little bit of money involved in it, but I didn't really know the whole story that, you know, when you take it to fair and you show it, that's the last time that you're going to see the pig, you know, that you've been hanging out with for the last however long. And so, you know, being young, I was like, wondering why all these little kids were crying and stuff at fair and, you know, little piggy is not coming home, you know, he's going to the market. <laughs> so that was uh, quite the, uh, the change uh, in dynamic going from Southern California to Southern Oregon. And uh, we lived in, in uh, Medford for about six months and then my parents found a house out in the Applegate Valley and uh, we got a house, it was like three acres, five bedrooms, and back then it was like 115,000. You know, it was like unbelievable. Um, and that was quite different too, growing up in the country versus a city boy. Um, so it took some, some getting used to, but because I was in sixth grade, it was pretty easy for me to make friends and stuff. My brother, on the other hand, he was a junior uh, in high school when we moved. And it was really hard on him. Uh, he was a varsity catcher. Um, just, you know, it was really tough for him to make that transition. No friends, kind of starting fresh right in the middle of his uh, high school days. So two years after he graduated, or I mean, excuse me, two years later when he graduated, he was right back to L.A. to be with his friends and uh, get back to where he wanted to be the whole time so kind of felt bad for him it was easier for me because i was still pretty young um, when i moved out into the applegate valley i lived in roosh um, where if you blinked you'd miss the town uh, it was that small uh, my dad bought a gas station and uh, so we had a little gas station minute market out in the country so everybody knew the maybreys uh, because they had to get gas on the way up to the lake, going fishing, all that kind of stuff. So that was uh, quite the experience. I, I would be helping my dad pumping gas like in sixth grade. And uh, a lot of uh, famous people in my eyes were living out in the country. They had second homes and stuff. And so one time I was, hey, because in Oregon, we pump the gas for you. You don't pump your own gas. And so I went up to the window. I said, yeah, what can I get you? And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's Kirstie Alley and, and Parker Stevenson, you know, and she just has this old Cherokee, and so I went in, I'm like, Dad, it's the lady from Look Who's Talking, you know, like, I was just blown away, but um, just neat, neat experiences out there. Um, I met a guy um, going to school, his name was Tim Goen, uh, he invited me to church, um, I started going to church uh, at Roosh Community Bible Church. This is small. I've, there might be more, more men in here that, than we had in the congregation, so it was a um, pretty small church. But started going to youth group, uh, really getting engaged with church, and uh, that was uh, very impactful you know, in my life. Um, I needed it. My parents were kind of going through some hard times. This is what I kind of learned later on in life, that they weren't just moving to Oregon, you know, just to move to Oregon because they thought it was pretty necessarily. It was because they had been kind of living a lifestyle that they wanted to kind of have a fresh start. Um, they were partying and kind of into uh, some extracurricular things. Uh, my dad was definitely doing things he probably shouldn't have been doing. But anyway, they wanted to kind of have a fresh start for us uh, and the family. So we moved there, got settled in, and, and he kind of just kept keeping on with his uh, drinking and drugs and things like that. So my mom came to me and was like, you know, if your dad doesn't clean up his act, I'm going to leave, leave him, basically. So I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, my life's ending. Um, so I started bringing it up. You know, at first it was just kind of like, I have an unspoken prayer. Can you just pray for my family? And so we started praying. Um, before long, my dad stopped drinking. 
started kind of cleaning his act up. Um, they started going to church um, where I was attending. Um, I then got baptized. Um, I was 12 years old when I got baptized. I'll, I won't forget the date because it was May 5th. It happened to fall on a Sunday, so Cinco de Mayo is everybody always usually celebrates for my baptism day. <laughs> Maybe why I like tequila or something, but I'm not sure. Um, so anyway, I, I lived a pretty good life. Uh, I never really knew, that's why I didn't know a lot of the problems that my parents were having because they never really, you know, I had seen a few things growing up, but nothing that was really too, uh, too traumatic or anything as far as my parents, but um, my parents started going to church, then they uh, started having a Bible study on Tuesday nights. Um, and they would have it every Tuesday night, and my brother and I would have to go in our rooms, and all these people would come over, and it was just really neat to see them, you know, stepping out in their faith. Um, my brother moved back to L.A., like I had mentioned, when I graduated, or when he graduated, when I, right around when I got baptized. So I pretty much grew up with no sibling in the house, you know, in my um, teenage years. So when I, I, w I was definitely a very, I kind of thought everything was, I had it all figured out, you know, early on. So my parents always wanted me to come home at a certain time and I would be like, no, I want to go hang out with my friends. And, and because we lived out in the country, it affected them because they'd have to drive all the way into town to pick me up and things. So one day my dad's just like, hey, if you want to do whatever you want, just give me your keys and you can do whatever you want. So I took him up on that. I was 16. I said, all right, hey, Ryan, can you follow me out to my parents' house? And my other friend had already said I could stay with him. And so I went home and my mom said, I got dinner ready for you. And I said, here's your keys that were so important to you and packed my pill pillow uh, case full of clothes and went on my, on my way. thought I had it all figured out. So I ended up living with a buddy and his family for two weeks. I was still going to school, playing baseball, going to work, like doing everything that I thought I would uh, need to keep doing. But then a couple weeks later, my mom came in and said, uh, she came into my work on like, I think it was Easter, and she was a super emotional. And so anyway, we, we worked things out. We, we compromised, made some adjustments on both ends, and I came back. So things were good. Um, I graduated in 96, moved out two days after I graduated. Um, I just was ready to go out into the world. Um, so I moved to Eugene, Oregon with some buddies. We weren't even old enough to sign our own lease on an apartment and we had to have a parent's co-sign because we were only 17. Um, so of course we had it all figured out at 17. Six months later, I'm back living at home, ran out of money, car broke down you know, the whole, the whole works. But now I'm back at home, my parents want to have rules for me. Well, now I've had six months of living on my own with no rules. And if I don't go to college, they want to charge me a little bit of rent. So I'm like, rules, pay money to live with my parents. See you later. I'm, I'm going to go get an apartment <laughs> with my buddies. So we, we went out, four of us, rented an apartment. Back then it was $500 for a two bedroom apartment. If you guys know what rents are these days, it's uh, probably $2,000. Uh, so we just split. It was $125 each. We sh two of us shared a room, and we, uh, we had it all figured out. So started kind of getting into partying and things like that, um, drinking a lot, you know, maybe smoking pot, things like that. Um, but kind of going a little bit the wrong direction. Um, when I lived in Oregon, I ended up moving in with a guy out in, in the college town in Ashland. We had a couple other buddies move in. We had a pool in the length of our house, indoor pool. Uh, so it was a, it was a party house, uh, and we would have some big parties. Uh, so I was just continuing to kind of go down that, that route of partying and um, not really having a purpose in life uh, and wondering why things are kind of starting to spiral out of control. So I was still playing baseball. I played uh, two years in college. Um, 
I played on summer league men's baseball teams where we put together guys that maybe played semi-pro or college ball. Um, so we would put together these really good teams and for summer we would go to Arizona and play in some baseball world series here. And so that's where I got my taste of Arizona. It was like in October and the weather's just beautiful. Um, it, was, it was amazing. So anyway, I came home one time from I don't know if it was my second time playing in the World Series or the first, but I came home. We got home about 2 in the morning, and uh, I woke up to all this commotion in my house and all these men yelling, and I didn't know what was going on. And I pulled my, I had one of those wooden doors that like kind of pocket doors, I guess what you call them. And uh, I kind of look out, and I'm in my brief underwear, and I'm like, what is going on? And my roommates are like hogtied, you know, on the floor. And there's all these men in there just like taking over, you know, our house. Um, and I didn't realize that one of my roommates kind of had been dealing with the wrong people. And uh, anyway, they, they came and did like a home uh, invasion on our house and hogtied us, left us, you know, basically helpless, you know, took everything and, and said, if you are here next time we come, then we're going to kill you. So obviously I was freaked out. Um, like about a month later, uh, I had an opportunity to move and go to um, Portland, Oregon, kind of get run from this, the scene and, and go up there. So anyway, I go up there, I move in with another guy who's a friend of our friends. Um, and him and the guy that I just tried to move away from, we were all good friends. They went with their girlfriends to Costa Rica. And so I'm in Portland, Oregon, by myself, running, trying to get in shape because I'm in a new city, got to look good. And uh, I'm looking for a job, finally get a job. Well, my friends come back from Costa Rica. I go have an interview, they offer me the job, I come home, I pull, I'm like, I'm gonna go get my roommate and go get some lunch and tell him I got a new job. And I pull in the driveway and literally like five black SUVs surround me, guns drawn, I'm just like, what's going on? You know, they, they um, I, I really didn't know what was going on at that time, but I knew like something was happening with my friends because they would kind of say like, they felt like people were following them and all this stuff. So anyway, I ended up moving in to get out of one situation, moved to another city, and I move in with another guy that supposedly has been running with a guy that has like five aliases and he lives in Canada and they're doing, you know, some big things. And now I'm, and, and they've been being watched for like two years and it's, now it's coming to uh, its go time. and. So I'm getting arrested, thinking that was the best day of my life to get a new job and start my new life, and we're uh, being interrogated downtown, and I can see all my friends in different rooms, and I'm just going, man, what's going on, you know? So anyway, that was just two crazy stories, you know, where I'm trying to, like, run away from um, problems, and they keep kind of following me, um, and... We ended up moving from there and moved to another one. It's just like when that happened, when when we got I got surrounded by all these undercover narcotic agents and stuff. Uh, they basically ransacked our house. They were looking for stuff, and um, it was really freaky because when I was getting interrogated, which if you've never been interrogated, hopefully you never have to, but um, they were my guess was that they had people inside our house going through everything and they're reading postcards and different letters and things that I had in my room from my parents who they ended up becoming missionaries um, after I graduated they they got into the missionary field so showing you that prayer does work you know they were looking at maybe getting divorced to going to church getting a Bible study and then sold their house and everything and became missionaries so I had like postcards and things in my room while well, when I was getting interrogated, they're telling me, they're trying to get me to rat on my friends and say, you know, we know you come from a good family. We, and they're telling me all these things that it's like they know everything about me and I'm just going, whoa, 
what this is crazy like how do they know about my parents and then um, anyway we ended up getting released I guess they didn't have enough information at that time it was still like a big thing being investigated and they let us go at like 8 o'clock at night and we'd been in there like pretty much all day and we went back to the house and the whole house was just basically upturned all my stuff that I had just moved in that I had worked hard for was anything worth money was gone because they potentially thought it could have been bought with drug money or you know whatever so it was a really unsettling feeling uh, I slept on the floor that night next to my friend that was on the couch uh, I was just really unsettling you know it was pretty traumatic so um, I'm gonna try and get 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 going with this but um, I continued to just kind of surround myself with with bad people um, they were just not, not necessarily that they were bad people they're just making bad choices in life um, drugs alcohol you know just those were a lot of the things in that era you know ecstasy was really big cocaine you know it started getting into different drugs you know and, and more party type drugs and so that's kind of the scene that I was in and uh, kind of found myself just continuing to spiral out of, out of control uh, to where I did, I did own a business. Um, I had a little chicken and rice business. And so I'd do that during the day where I sold bento uh, boxes, like whiter brown rice, steamed chicken uh, skewers and things. So um, I did that for four years. Well, when I kind of was hitting rock bottom with addiction and um, I had lost about five friends uh, from overdose, car accidents, um, you name it. And the way that we kind of dealt with it was we would just numb ourselves and do <coughs> drugs, you know, the same drugs that just killed our friend, you know, what a smart thing to do is let's do more drugs. Uh, but that's just how we dealt with our, um, our problems and things. So anyway, I, I was not doing good. I called my brother. He's like, you got to get out of there. Um, I really just took a one-way ticket uh, out of town, and I just kind of left my business, left everything. My friend obviously um, had some um, some skin in the game because I had bought it from him, and I was paying him back for the loan. Uh, so he kind of stepped in and took over and was able to get the business sold. Uh, but I had to get out of there because I was going nowhere fast. So I moved to Sacramento. Um, my girlfriend at the time, she was all for me getting out of here because I needed to make some changes. So anyway, I went to Sacramento um, to start my life over, and I got plugged into a church there, um, started making some changes. I just really needed the support of family because when I was up in Portland and stuff, my parents had became missionaries. My brother moved to L.A., and all my family lived in California, so I was kind of just feeling empty, uh, didn't really have that. Christian, you know, support or role models or anything in my life at that time. So uh, my brother and I, we started serving at the church and uh, just really started feeling like, you know, hey, I got, got some purpose here. My girlfriend at the time, uh, she moved down and uh, we ended up, she kind of gave me an ultimatum, like, you're either going to move forward with me or I'm moving on, you know, type of thing. So I was like, man, she followed me down here, helped me kind of get down here. Like, I should probably not lose this one. Uh, but not really realizing that we never talked about anything real, uh, you know, as far as goals and what we want to accomplish in life. Where do we see ourselves five years from now, ten years from now, our faith, any, any of that stuff. Um, but we got married. And... Uh, started having kids and we uh, we ended up getting um, kind of hooked on pain medication both of us and uh, it it basically we, we moved we bought a house in 2006 because I was in the mortgage industry uh, we, we had to buy a house because everybody was making so much money in equity like let's buy a house well then shortly after the mortgage crisis happened and uh, my First house has to be brand new, 400,000, got cars and, you know, trying to live that 
that lifestyle of all these materialistic things. Uh, within two years, the house was worth 300,000. Um, I, I was in the mortgage industry, so I started losing my jobs everywhere, going to a new job. Sorry, we're closing down, laying off 20% of the workforce. So I'm losing all my equity. I'm you know, just feeling kind of hopeless again. So we decided um, let's sell the house and we're gonna move back to Oregon. And uh, that way we could be closer to family because my wife's family at the time lived up there. And um, so we moved back to Portland. And, uh, you know, I had all these memories back in Portland that were not great, you know. So um, I got back into the restaurant business because that's kind of was an easy way to get in. I was doing management work where I was working till two in the morning. Not a great job for somebody that's trying to raise a family and stuff. So I got into banking, um, started working at Bank of America as a senior banker. Um, and then I had an opportunity um, to move to Arizona. And I said, hey, would you mind moving to Arizona? We could buy a house for like $80,000. This was in 2011. And I remember playing baseball here. I'm like, this place is amazing. Like three bedroom, two bath with a pool. It was like $80,000 for some of them. So she's like, sure, I'll move. And uh, so I put in for a transfer. 30 days later, we moved to Arizona. That was 2011. We had been taking pain medication, started out very small, kind of recreational, and then progressed and progressed and progressed to where uh, when I finally stopped doing uh, pain medication in 2014, uh, I was taking some days 300 milligrams of oxyco uh, oxycodone, uh, which if anybody knows about pain medication, uh, 300 milligrams is a lot. I was taking a, about uh, five 30 milligram pills every day, uh, and I was not not good, but not really knowing it because I was just kind of numb to life. I still did my job every day, still was bringing in the paycheck, but as my tolerance got higher and higher, I had a prescription, but it wasn't enough. And so then I had to start looking elsewhere for more. And my wife is the same thing. So if you know, buying it through <laughs> the Black market is uh, very expensive. They're trying to make a bunch of money, and when you're so hooked on this medication, you'll do anything, you know, to continue to just, really, I, I didn't look at it as like getting high anymore. It was just like to just be normal, you know, and be well. Um, so it was, it was just terrible. Like it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. So. When we finally decided that we have to get off these things, she went first, we just did a cold turkey. Um, sh she needed about a week to, and she still was not doing great after that, but then it was my turn. Uh, and then I, I would just went into a separate room and, and it was the worst, worst thing of my life. Um, so I thought, so it took me about a month to get over my sickness because all these things started coming out after, um, the medication kind of had worn off now. I'm starting to feel again. I'm all my ailments. I'm like, have a fatty liver that I didn't know about. I'm, my heart is racing so bad. Like I just had a lot of anxiety and couldn't sleep and different things like that. So once we start feeling, now like my wife and I, we're like, we don't even know who each other are. We just have grown apart. You know, we just been kind of just doing life. But um, anyway, she, once we were getting better, I thought we were doing good. We were going to CCV. Like I knew that we needed to start making some changes and she just was done with me. You know, she had said, I'm not in love with you anymore and have fallen out of love and I want to get a divorce. So that was like a huge shock because I thought we were making some, some good steps to get better. But anyway, um, we, we decided we're gonna separate and uh, start moving forward with the divorce. Um, and probably where it got the most real was when I um, got home after work, which she did give me a notice that it was gonna happen, but it didn't really hit home until I actually walked through the door. But I got home, my kids are gone, my wife at the time is gone. She took all their furniture.
And that was, you know, my rock bottom. So I knew I, with the foundation that I had from youth group and uh, different things growing up that I needed to get, get back to church. And uh, so I started going to church at CCV, taking my kids because I knew they needed it. And then uh, that's where I had met my wife. And um, God blessed me with an amazing woman. She's a pastor's daughter. Uh, went through a tough divorce, but um, she was exactly you know, what I needed uh, to help me. Uh, and I helped her too, uh, but definitely she was everything that, that I needed you know, to be successful in um, my faith and, and everything. So kind of fast forward, I know we're, <laughs> I'm talking a lot here, but um, I, I've met amazing people. I have a lot of buddies here that, um, and I've met a lot of you here at ISI, but three years ago, um, my boss at the time, Dennis, we both said, hey, have you heard about this Iron Sharpens Iron? And uh, we said, hey, we should go to that. We, I wanted to go. So three years ago, we went, and went when it was out in Vistancia at the HOA. And uh, I haven't stopped going since. And my life um, has changed dramatically. Um, I've learned so many just great lessons and takeaways from everybody's testimonies and everybody's speakings up here that I've started to apply to my life. And the one that probably was the most impactful was um, getting a mentor. And so I reached out to Ted and asked if he would be my mentor back in 2020. And ever since then, my life's changed dramatically. Um, I've done things that I never thought I would do in my life. So um, I'm just very blessed uh, for the friendships that I have here. I'm very blessed for uh, the opportunity to speak here and share my story. Uh, but I definitely want to get into some of the other stuff that I have because I know we got to get going here. So, all right. So I definitely have gone over my time. That happens when you're not a professional speaker. But hopefully you guys can give me some grace, just like God did. And uh, you can give me 15 more minutes of your time not to speak so that we can get into small groups, because uh, that's the most important part of our, our day in the morning, uh, is when we get into groups of five or six. Um, and that's where people can really share uh, what's going on in their life. So I got some questions that I'll put up on the board at the end. Uh, but this was uh, something that Rick Warren said, you know, without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. And without meaning, life has no significance or hope. So when I decided to go all in for Jesus and to put God first in my marriage, my finances, my my everything, you know, and not have it about me anymore. Um, everything started getting better, you know, my relationships, um, my whole life has changed. So definitely encourage you to uh, not put yourself first, not put your work first, not put your finances, all that stuff. It, that's the problem that I had in my life is my priorities were always out of whack. Things were going pretty good. God went down on the bottom. Um, versus now, I thank him every day for everything that I got. And uh, I put him first. I read my Bible, do Bible studies, do um, church, serve, all these different things that I have to do in order to keep God first in my life. So these are just some pictures that uh, mean a lot to me, different serving uh, coached with some of you guys, Jim here, um, in neighborhood groups uh, with a lot of my buddies here, um, serving with my family, went on my first missions trip. Um, like, this is, this is my life. It's good stuff. So you'll get a copy of this. So these are just some verses that obviously mean a lot to me, like as far as um, having purpose in your life. So definitely uh, take a look at those. And this was something that I really liked that Rick Warren said to you. God redeemed you so you could do his holy work. You're not saved by service. You're saved for service. In God's kingdom, you have a 
a place, a purpose, a role, and a function to fulfill. This gives your life great significance and value. So that's something that I've applied to my life. I'm definitely out there trying to be, you know, the light, the salt and the light of the, the world and, and tell people about my story, tell people about Jesus, you know, because that's, uh, that's Jesus saves. So my last question before we get into groups is who's ready to live their life with purpose and go all in for Jesus? Because that picture looks pretty amazing, if you ask me. Uh, when I saw that, I was like, I want, I want my friends and my family and everybody to be rejoicing, like, like that, that family or whoever they are. But I'll meet them someday. So we're going to break out into small uh, hold, groups. Hold on one second, Corey. Guys, let's thank Corey for his testimony today and his presentation. What? Good job. You want to tell one, one last thing? <laughs> Sorry. Um, out in the lobby, I think a lot of you have already gotten them. This book did a lot for me. I kind of use it as a little ministry now uh, that you can do very easily. I, I buy them at Goodwill for three bucks or something. I clean them up, take the sticky stuff off them. And so I've, in, over the last month, I've been able to find close to 30 of these books. Um, if, if you would like to take one, it's, it's my, my gift to you. Um, but if you're married, do it with your spouse and commit to it. Do it for 40 days. You read one chapter a day for 40 straight days. I read the first 10 chapters probably 20 times and then would give up because life would get me going. So this last time, my wife and I committed to do it. And even when we weren't in town together, I would call her up on FaceTime. She'd go into a separate room and we committed to each other that we're going to get it done. Ch changed our marriage. Um, I pray for my wife at night now. It, it's just amazing. So grab so, a book. So guys, we're not going to be able to be in small groups today. I want to be respectful of your time. We don't have time for that, but you're welcome to stay in fellowship. If you'd like, small groups are the most important thing we do. So next week we'll be back into that. Shaw will be speaking next week. We're looking forward to having him. So thank you for coming today. I want you to know over 100 men came to ISI today. So thank you, guys. That's a new record for the Lord. So thank you. And um, so get to know each other a little bit with, like we did in the beginning and hang out for a little bit. And we'll see you next week.